Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, this is looking at the night sky that we have in our beautiful summer that's just only actually just arrived at the moment. I've also got uh, Keith, Keith Austin with me. Say hello, hello Keith. <laughs> hello people. Hi. Okay, so uh, we get straight into it because we've got quite a bit to look at at the moment. Now, first of all, I had to mention that uh, you know we had Starlight coming up this weekend. Uh, that's had to be postponed until February uh, for several reasons, but also the reason that the forecast is not good for the weekend. I'm afraid we've got a big front coming in and so on. Hopefully by uh, by February we'll be back to normal. So it's going to be actually running from f uh, Friday, February the 17th to Sunday the 19th, all right? Uh, that's uh, Stonehenge RTRO, but bookings are essential um, and all the details there. If you uh, haven't got anything to write down at the moment, you can always go onto our webpage, the Stonehenge webpage, or, or the Phoenix Astronomical Society and check it out there. Okay, so that's start date. And I'm afraid you might have to put up with me talking there. And I think, Keith, you're going to be talking as well, aren't you? Uh, I will be doing a bit of talking. I haven't got my keyboard with me today, um, so there won't be any music. I'm not going to attempt to sing because the last time I, I did any singing, I was told not to give up the day job. But um, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, Richard and I will be doing a bit of uh, bit of talking about uh, what's up in the sky. And um, as Richard said, there's um, possibly another storm front coming in, so we might have to put up with a few more wet days, particularly over this weekend. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, nev sort of nevertheless, there's always really exciting things to be done at Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so, so that's we've had to move it. And what you've got with Stardate is a whole variety of uh, uh, talks, uh, activities and photography, night sky tours, uh, telescope viewing, exhibitions, movies, the lot. You've got it. And it runs over a period. And for those who are living at any distance, we can also arrange for you to camp or if you've got a camper van to bring that out with you as well. Okay, so that's Star Date coming up on in February 17th to the 19th. Okay, so let's get on with our night sky. Well, going out, walking out tonight on a nice clear night, well, hopefully it will be clear tonight, looking north, the most brilliant object you're going to see in the sky due north is in fact not a star at all, it's the planet Mars. And Mars came closest to the Earth <clears throat> on December the 8th, and that's the only time we see when Mars is really brilliant, as it, the Earth passes by it it really brightens and then it fades away as the Earth moves away. Right? And of course for astronomers, that's our key time, what we call opposition. Um, when the opposition simply means that the, the uh, Mars is a planet is opposite the sun, directly opposite the sun. It's the opposite the sun in our sky. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And that means that we get at that time we get the most wonderful views. And of course Mars is one of the most exciting objects. It was for me because be more science fiction stories written about Mars than any other place in the universe. And I could always remember Mum taking me to the movies to watch um, Invaders from Mars. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. I've seen it since, it's pretty corny, but uh, at the time I remember coming home and looking up at the stars and thinking, well, Mars must be up there and wondering about life out there, you know? Yes. I. Um I was uh, looking at Mars through uh, one of my telescopes last night, as a matter of fact, because it's the first clear night we've had for a while, and uh, it looked beautiful through the telescope. Uh, with a small telescope, you can't see too much. You're certainly not going to see the, uh, the major surface features on Mars or anything. But just like you, Richard, I was looking up at Mars last night through my telescope, and you could see this disk, and um, I was thinking of all the science fiction uh, books and mm. movies and uh, so forth that have that have been set there ever since um, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote um, wrote a princess from Mars mm. way back or was it the 19th century well it's, you yes. see the thing yes. is it's the one world that looks of the other planets going around the sun it's the one that most closely looks like the earth and furthermore uh, if you observe Mars over the sea you see it's got seasons and seasonal changes exactly. ice cakes got, and wow uh, the dark areas in the 19th century, they thought it was vegetation because they seemed to grow. We now know that it's not vegetation. It's it, will grow, it will grow every year. <laughs> and yeah. then uh, at the other end of the year, the Martian year, it would die back and yeah. this sort of thing. Well, what, what else could it be but vegetation? Yeah. yeah. 
It's and yet, blown, what was it? Blow, windblown sand. It was windblown <laughs> sand. <laughs> Covering it up and then clearing it away yeah. again. And so on. So that's, that's Mars. It's an absolutely fascinating object that's in our sky at the moment. And incidentally, there's always the trouble with observing Mars. It's, it's not a large planet. So to see it well, you need high magnification. And in, in order to use high magnification on a telescope, you need to have a, not only the sky is clear, but it, also the air is very, very steady. Otherwise, it just blurs as you magnify up. But Mars is not the only planet in, the, in our night sky at the moment. Um, there's actually two others. One of them is Venus. You might catch a glimpse of Venus in the, uh, in the western evening twilight. But the other bright star-like object is the planet Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system. <clears throat> and now, of course, it's got something, I can't remember the exact number, but it's more than 50 moons or something like that. Yes. But four of them you can see with a pair of binoculars if you look carefully. Yep. Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Mm. And they're the four, uh, they're called Galilean moons because they were the ones discovered by Galileo Galilei in, mm. um, uh, in Padua in Italy mm. when he first turned his little telescope on the planet Jupiter and this is what he saw. Yes, right, yeah. There's four moons. <coughs> and the interesting thing with Jupiter, it's a giant planet. You could fit all the other planets inside it. In many ways, it's more like the sun than it is the earth right it's made mostly of hydrogen and so on uh, and it rotates very very rapidly so even watching it in a short period in the telescope you can begin to see changes and so on but of course with jupiter unlike mars you're not looking at the solid surface you're just looking at the clouds that swirl around at the top there mm. for those of you watching it on tv you can see that the great red spot it actually looks more orange at the moment <coughs> But that's actually a, a gigantic cyclone, bigger than the Earth, right? So that gives you an idea. And that's been raging for, what, centuries, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You could fit uh, at least two Earths inside that yeah. uh, that red spot there. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, briefly, when I think of Jupiter, I remember the, um, uh, the Star Wars, the... Uh, uh, the third Star Wars movie, uh, when they visited the uh, cloud planet, uh, Bespin, I think it was called, and that is probably what it's like on Jupiter. You live, you know, there are clouds and clouds and clouds and clouds, and there is no land. There's no solid surface mm -hmm. underneath those clouds. That's 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 what it's like. It's mm -hmm. it's very alien compared to uh, uh, Earth. It's not only that. I mean, even if there was a solid surface there. Excuse me, there's so much mass there that you would weigh considerably more. Yes. <laughs> About 300 times your current weight if you were yes. standing on its surface. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the two, <coughs> excuse me, two bright planets in the sky. But looking to the north, the most prominent uh, constellation in the sky is Orion. And I think just about any person can probably recognize this uh, constellation. Uh, it's the most familiar. Um, uh, the, the belt stars of Orion uh, form what down here in New Zealand they call the pot. I've drawn that up for people watching on, uh, on the TV there. But the, the important thing, and there, there's Orion coming up where you can see it. There he is, the great hunter. Right? But of course, it's always confusing often to people living in the southern hemisphere because whenever you put a, a constellation figure up, it's upside down. And that's, of course, because the reason is that... Um, all, most of these constellations were um, observed and first recognised in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, if you travel to the Northern Hemisphere, everything will appear upside down. But Northern Hemispheres don't believe that in England, Britain. It's down here with yes. upside down. Yep. Yes. OK, so there's Orion there and there's his belt. The, uh, the importance of Orion, though, is that belt of three stars that marks the celestial equator. Right? And that's really like... <clears throat> the equator that it transferred out into space. That means that those stars always rise due east and always set due west. All right? So they're a, a prime uh, navigational beacon. And also, those uh, because of that, Orion is visible from both the northern and the southern hemisphere, unlike a lot, a lot of constellations which have only been seen in one or the other. Okay. Mm. So, anyway... <clears throat> And we also, we often use Orion as a, um, a signpost in the sky, as it were. <clears throat> so if you go along the three belt stars upwards, you come to the brightest star in the sky. That's Sirius. 
Now, say bright star at the moment, of course, uh, it's been outshone by Mars and Jupiter's in the sky, uh, which we now know are planets, but planet actually means wandering star. That's what yeah. our ancestors thought it was what star that wanders around. But of the f normal fixed stars, uh, Sirius is the brightest and um, very interesting object. It's actually quite close to the Earth in cosmic terms. And its distance is just over eight light years. <coughs> But it's a lot brighter than the sun. It's uh, 25 times brighter than the sun. So we have a bright star, 25 times brighter than the sun, and it's also uh, very close to the Earth. And this is why it's the literally the brightest star in the sky. Mm. Yeah, its total out um, output of energy is, then, is 31 times greater. That's mm. because uh, Sirius is a lot hotter than our sun, and a lot of its energy is, is blasted out in the UV, which in you can't really see. But you can definitely, you'll notice this, if you look at Mars and then have a quick look at Sirius, you can see the difference in the colours. You can see that um, Sirius is this white hot star with this bluish tinge on it, right? So that's Sirius. But the interesting thing about Sirius, <coughs> unlike our sun, which is a single star with the planets orbiting around it, it turns out that Sirius is a binary star. And it's got a companion, which we call the pup. And the reason why we call the pup is because Sirius is invariably often called the dog star, <laughs> because it is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the mm. great dog. Mm. <clears throat> so its companion star, which cannot be seen without a large telescope, is called the pup. And it orbits around, Jupiter, uh, around Sirius in a period of just over 50 years. However, this other star, whereas, you know, um, Sirius is 25 times brighter than the sun. Uh, this star is 387 times fainter. <laughs> so, yes. is that, and that can only tell you, and it's the same temperature, most, most of the same temperature. Yes. This means this thing must be very small. All right? And indeed it is. Um, it was the first white dwarf that was ever discovered. And the white dwarf is actually the corpse of a star. So once upon a time, Sirius had a much bigger and brighter companion. And the brighter and bigger and brighter star is, the quicker it evolves and runs for its life. It goes for its fuel quicker. Mm, that's right. Yes. And then once upon a time, so that would have been a brilliant scud star in our sky, and then it's died and it's all that's left is its core, right? Mm. So what you've got is this core of, of carbon, uh, which is left, at the centre there, and it's gradually cooling down and crystallising. It's about the size of the Earth, but you know what it's turning into, don't you? Well, when you say crist uh, carbon and it's crystallising, that uh, rings two bells to my head. Diamond. That's right. Yes. It's turning into a gigantic diamond. So we've the got this the <laughs> invisible companion orbiting Sirius, a quarter white dwarf. It's the core of a, a star that basically ran out of fuel and disintegrated, and it's made out of diamond yeah but don't think don't think about going out there and uh, <laughs> i'm going to mine some of this diamond because you've got the same mass or, or mass as the uh, sun compressed into an object <laughs> size of the earth if you if you landed on there you'd you'd an average person would weigh something like several hundred tons um because of the intense yeah, gravity and yeah and if you the moment you landed and stepped foot on it your body would be flattened over an area the size of a football field. So, yeah. <laughs> so no diamond mining on no. the companion of Sirius then. No. <laughs> and as I say, this was the very first white dwarf discovered. But of course, since that time, we've discovered many more. Okay. Right, the realms of the giants, all right? So we're going to have a closer look at them in here. Okay. So looking back at... Um, Going back to uh, Orion, the brightest star in the constellation of Orion is uh, Rigel. All right? It's dead easy to pick. And um, it's an amazing star. Um, well, remember Sirius was only about eight light years away. Rigel is 770 light years away. And the very fact that it is so bright must tell you it's an extremely bright star. And indeed, this is the case, folks. Most stars that you can see in the night sky are not the average or common garden form of star, like our sun. They are giants. It's a bit like, you know, looking across a, a paddock. You immediately pick out the um, elephants if you've got them, 
or otherwise, uh, you know, you can, you can pick out the uh, cattle and so on, but you miss the smaller things which are more and more common down mm. there. And that's exactly the same with the stars. Mm. The stars we see, and Rigel is a monster star in itself. Mm. It illuminates a gaseous cloud, which we call the Witch Head Nebula. And for those of you watching this on TV, uh, you can probably see, work out the witch head there. That's some of the material which was originally around uh, 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 Rigel. It's being blasted away and has been illuminated, reflecting the light of, of Rigel. So there's the witch head. So is that um, the, some of the stuff that um, coalesced and compressed to form the star? Could well be, but you've got to remember, when we look up at Orion, uh, we don't see so many stars, though it's near the, uh, on the Milky Way, you don't see so many stars there because mm. the reason is there's a vast dark cloud stretching right the way across the area. Yes. And it just simply blots out the lighter, more distant stars. It's about 1,300 light years away. And the bits that we do see are simply being illuminated by stars a little bit closer. Yes. So the star is actually illuminating this yeah. cloud of gas. That's right, yeah. Yes, yeah. Rather, rather like a... Um, um, a fluorescent light is illuminated by the um, gas inside, yeah. Now, um, for those of you watching this TV, I just brought up a photograph I took of Rigel some years ago. <coughs> I'm joking, he's not even questioning me. It's a, it's a painting I made of Rigel, all right? Uh, it's a, um, 770 light years away, and this star is 66,000 times brighter than the sun. Its mass, however, is 17 times, and its diameter 78 times. Right? So this is a ferociously hot star, and it's blasting matter from its surface out into space. But close by uh, Rigel, and you can see this in a large telescope, are what appears to be two other stars. But each of these is a double star, and they are companions of Rigel, so it's actually a system of five stars. Five stars. Yeah, yes. that's right. So it's a binary star system. So there you go. Now, Rigel might be the brightest star in the constellation of Orion, throwing as far as the light's throwing out, but it's not certainly not the biggest. That uh, title goes to Betelgeuse. And you can pick this out because it's definitely orange-red in colour. Very similar to Mars, OK, when you look at it. And... Uh, it also is a giant star, a long way away, right? So, yeah. and in fact, this star, because it's a red star, it, it's actually huge in size. You see, the hotter a star surface, the more energy it's re releasing in that area. Red stars only, for per unit area, only radiate a small amount compared to white star. So if you see a big red star, you know that star must be very big in physical size. Yes, so it's, it's, it's all to do with surface temperature. Um, I used to do a lot of blacksmithing in that uh, when I was younger, and uh, I was taught how to actually judge the temperature of the metal by the colour that it glows in the, in the forge. Mm. And you start off with just a very deep crimson red, then bright red, then orange, and then bright orange, and then yellow as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It actually goes through the colours of the rainbow. It would eventually reach blue, except it vaporises. Ex exactly. <laughs> but if you could heat it further, it would become white and then blue, white and then blue, uh, rather, rather like a star. So you can actually tell the temperature yeah. of a star without using any instruments at all, just by looking up at it. The colour, yeah. That's right. A red star has a cooler surface temperature than a, um, than a white star or a blue star. The vast majority of stars are so far away, as includes the close ones, that we cannot see them as a physical... We see them as a point of light, with one exception. With the Hubble, using the Hubble Space Telescope, Betelgeuse is low, so large that a Hubble Space Telescope was actually able to magnify it from space and actually photograph it. So th for those of you watching this on TV, you can see an image. There is Betelgeuse, right? It's a red, ill-defined object. It's absolutely huge, right? So Betelgeuse um, <clears throat> is 430 light years away. It's 70, uh, 10 and a half thousand times brighter than the sun, but its diameter is 936 larger times larger than the sun. But not only that, folks, this star is gradually pulsating, so its actually size is actually changing. Yeah. Right. How long does it take to pulsate? Uh, uh, it's, it, it's irregular at the moment. Over the course of several months, 
Mm. Right? So you, you will notice it if you observe it over time. Yes. It's now, been, it's um, just, if you, what I've got is, it, if you imagine our solar system, it's big, right? And it just come up on the screen is a um, image showing our solar system with all the orbits of the planets to scale, right? So you can see the Earth there in the middle, uh, very close. Now, if we were orbiting uh, Betelgeuse from the same distance, this is how big it would be. It would fill up the entire solar system out to the orbit of Jupiter. So that's an entire star <laughs> occupying space up to up to up the to orbit, Jupiter, the yeah. orbit of Jupiter. We will be well inside it, so we yes. couldn't exist. And this this star can, is actually at the end, near the end of its life. So you see, what will happen is Rigel, when it begins to die, it too will turn into a, a red star like this one, and then eventually, because its mass is so large. Something really dramatic is going to happen with Betelgeuse. It's going to explode. And recently, astronomers have been observing it because it has been observing some strange behaviour, as it were. Yes, I've been watching it myself, yeah. and there's some, definitely something odd going on with, yeah. uh, with the star Betelgeuse. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the constellation of... Uh, uh, sorry. It's, it's at that point where sooner or later it's, it will explode. And mm. when it does so, you'll be going to see it in broad daylight. Fortunately, 470 light years away, it should be far enough away as not to be a danger um, to us. Should be. Should be. I like your confidence, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, these, these explosions are on such a scale. Um, yeah. You wouldn't want to be near one of those. It would wipe, wipe the Earth out. Absolutely. Yes. And indeed, if we, if we look in from Orion, just below Orion is a constellation of Taurus, the bull, right? And in the year 1054, a brilliant star was seen in the constellation of Taurus. I've just brought it up for you watching this on TV just below Mars. This star was so bright, it could be seen in broad daylight. And, and then it gradually faded away. And this was recorded yes. by, the, uh, by the Chinese yes, that's in, right. ten, in the year 1054. And they called it a nova, meaning new star. But this was no new star. This oh. was actually a very, very remote giant star that had suddenly exploded. So if you imagine Betelgeuse is much, much further away than it is, and then it explodes, it will appear as this brilliant object in the sky. Okay. Yes. So that's where this, this, this supernova was. And then it faded away and was lost. Now, when we have a look there with big telescopes, we find this, this is what we call the Crab Nebula. And this is the wreck of that star that exploded a thousand years ago. When I say it exploded a thousand years ago, of course, if it's also several thousand years, uh, light years away, yes. it actually exploded thousands and That's thousands. right, yes. It gets quite confusing. The further, the further away an object is in, the, uh, in deep space, the uh, further back in time <laughs> that we are seeing it because of the finite speed of light. Mm. So that star, uh, we saw it exploding in 1050, 1056, was it? Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, the distance of the Crab Nebula, <coughs> Nebula we know it's six thousand five hundred light years. Right. It's got a diameter of three and a half light years. So, in other words, this Crab Nebula could roughly fit the space between here and Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. Yes. And it's still expanding the rate of a thousand kilometers yes. per second. Right. And that's what happens when a massive star um, so. basically detonates. And is it what you may be interested in is that it is at this. We'll go into this in detail much later, but it's when, only when a giant star explodes that the creation of heavy elements occur. Right. The reason why gold, platinum, is rare mm. is because they're formed inside a supernova, which itself is rare. Yeah. So when you've got a piece of gold on your finger, just remember <laughs> that that's actually part of what was the, the core of a star that yes. exploded billions of years ago. It's a piece of star stuff. It, it is, exactly. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there it is. But looking with big telescopes, there is an object near the centre. Uh, here's a beautiful photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see gas swirling, swirling around. And although this star exploded, there is a core left behind, but it's not a white dwarf. Right? Have a close-up look at it here. Right? There's where the actual star is, sitting near the centre of this swirling mass. And what we've got is what we call a pulsar. And this mm. is the core that's left behind, right? Its diameter is only 10 kilometers. 
but its core is still two times the mass of the solar system. All right? So each cubic centimetre weighs a trillion tonnes. Okay? And this thing is rotating at high speed and as it does, it sends out radio waves, and that's why it's called a pulsar, because we picked up the radio mm. waves first. Right? Each time the star spins around, it, it's generating a beam, and the beam sweeps around like a lighthouse, and yeah. you get a click. And you, a, wouldn't, you wouldn't better listen to this, because no. it's rotating 30 times a second. That's right, but yeah. Of course, the radio telescope picks up this radio noise, and then we thought that it's... Did, 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 yes. As it's going, as it's... Well, the crab, uh, the uh, crab pulsar is actually uh, spinning so fast, at 30 times a second, and it actually sounds like a, uh, like a British motorcycle. <laughs> Sort of that's like that, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the sound it makes in a radio telescope. So this is the corpse of a star that died. <coughs> if it had been much bigger than it is now, it's two solar masses. It would have, it would have actually formed a black hole. Yeah, right? and that's the other thing that can happen. Yeah. Okay, so there is the crab pulsar, and of course, there's all this series of events we're seeing here in in little tiny snapshots at different points in the universe is what's going to happen to Betelgeuse over a period of time. We're not sure when this will occur, of mm. course, but uh, we just don't know enough about it. Okay, mm. so when's it all going to happen? Well, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. They did wonder earlier whether it was going to explode, but we just have to wait and see. But the very fact that its fluctuations are changing tells you that something's unstable yes. in there. It's becoming significantly dimmer. Yeah. <laughs> and that's cause for concern. You know. yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I've just, for those of you who won't... Yeah, when it explodes, it's going to be a brilliant object and almost as bright as the sun that you're going to see in your uh, daytime sky. When it explodes, it's <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty amazing when you think of it. You know, we can. You're going to be able to see that yeah. if Betelgeuse explodes, we'll be able to see it in daylight that's right, in the yeah. sky. Yes, yeah, that's right. Anyway, uh, the sword of the lion. As I said, if, and I've just pulled up an image behind the background of a lion is full of dust and gas, and the sword of a lion is absolutely magnificent because. Whereas we've been looking at the death of stars, in the background, we've got the opposite occurring, the birth of stars. And the mm. sword of Orion is an, in the closest region to the solar system where new stars are being formed. Now we're looking at a close-up of this, and it's a magnificent region. This dust and gas is illuminated by stars embedded within it. For those of you looking at this on TV, these three stars here, and I'm pointing to them, they're the three belt stars, and you can see close to one of them is this object here, which is the Horsehead Nebula. There it is there. I'll bring it up. You soon see why it's called the Horsehead, all right? You've got to remember this column is light years long. It's just a, a dense column of dust and gas left behind from the formation uh, as the radiation from those other stars is blasting the cloud outwards and moving matter away. And the Horsehead is a, a region that's dense and it's surviving longer. A bit like a... Uh, sort of me saw in a desert, you know what I mean? Those pillars and things. Yes, like yeah. exactly. Yeah. So this is radiation pressure. In other words, the actual radiation coming from the nearby stars mm. is, yeah. is acting almost like the wind blowing sand across a mesa in the uh, in the desert. Yeah, that's right. But what we have noticed most of all is the object I've just brought up, which is the uh, Orion Nebula, right? And it is, in fact, folks, a crater in the sky, all right? <laughs> uh, because what's happened in the centre here, that beneath it, we look at the crater at an angle, and new stars have just been formed in there, giant stars, and the material at the top of the cloud has been hurled outwards, all right? So this is the great Orion Nebula, and it's awesome to watch. If we sneak inside, and you can actually see this with a relative border, you'll see what you call a trapezium, four little stars. Say little stars, these things are hundreds of thousands of times brighter than the sun. But they are, of course, um, mostly UV objects. They're the first born. Right? But what we're seeing here is the birth of a star cluster. And as we look around closer, we find all these baby stars about the size of our sun being formed, and they're surrounded in disks in which new planetary systems are forming. Mm. So here we've got a a cluster of stars being formed, and around those stars, new worlds are being created. 
And if you look along the Milky Way, you will see lots of star clusters. And these are actually means that they're quite young because our sun was part of a star cluster at one time. But over the passage of time, those stars disintegrate. Right? So the sun had once had, a, had uh, companions. Oh, yes. Like uh, brothers, brothers and sisters. And, sisters. and we yes. have been looking for them. And uh, if people come along to our star date thing, uh, I'm going to be talking about some of that and looking at some of the stars we've identified as possibly yes. a brother or sister around the sun. Yes. Taking the Ryan's belt in the opposite direction, um, we come to a, the, the most famous star cluster in the sky, of course, is the Pleiades, also known as Matariki. And while you can see six or seven bright stars there, all the stars vary in brightness according to their mass. There's about 400 stars there, all right? And so Pleiades is very young as well, okay? Just to remind you folks, I have to wind up now. Stonehenge at the moment is open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day during January, and then on Wednesday to Sunday in February. And finally, to finish off with, remember, star date in February, starting on February the 17th, all right, and we're going to have a special program where we're going to take you out to the Orion Nebula and some of the other wonders we've been looking at in the in the show tonight. Okay, folks, uh, but you do need to register. Okay. You say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>